hello from Oslo. Welcome to today's afternoon tea conversation. Uh, I'm Ingeborg and I'm the leader of Women in Global Health Norway. And with this series, we're highlighting some of our members, especially those that have been appointed to our advisory group. And today I'm looking forward to having a cup of virtual tea with my good friend Ingvil Mohman, a political scientist from the University of Bergen, the very same university that we met many years ago. Ingvil has a PhD from the University of Gießen in Germany and postdoctoral habilitation in the social sciences from the University of Cologne. Uh, she has a leg in both Norway and Germany, and she has dedicated her life to the important topic of children born of war. So welcome, Ingvil. Oh, but, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ingeborg. Uh, great to be here. Yes, it's wonderful to see you and uh, you're tuning in from your home in Colonia and uh, I'm greeting you from my home in Oslo. So uh, just to kick us off, Ingvil, I'm curious to hear about your journey from Bergen to becoming a professor and a leader in Germany. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the roads you have traveled? Yes, well, sure. Um, I don't know how much time we've got. It's uh, it could probably talk about that for ages, but I'll try to do the big, uh, the, the quick tour and the quick summary. So actually, um, I've been um, traveling quite a lot. I, I was born in Bonn, but I was more or less raised and grew up in Norway. And uh, then uh, during my studies in comparative politics in Bergen, I was uh, writing and interested in the development of the German party system of the unification. So I figured being an Erasmus student in Bonn would be a great thing to do. Uh, the estimated time was the one year and basically I have been there ever since. So this is one of the first tours of how you then at least land in another country. And it's what I usually tell my students, you know, going semesters abroad may have consequences for life. So. Um, no reason to regret it, though. As I say, I've kept a, a leg in in Norway too, in particular due to my research, which I will probably tell a little bit more about in a bit. Um, I then started working for the University of Cologne and uh, at what is now called the Gesit Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences, which is something equivalent to the Norwegian uh, so data service for the social sciences or data service. I think they've changed the names a couple of times. And there I've been for 25 years now, actually more than 25 years. Uh, and with a lot of the different developments, uh, and when you say, well, becoming a leader, you know, they have this saying here in Germany that, you know, do women go different roads than men? No, but they go walk them differently. Maybe that's an international saying. So, of course, you can only evaluate things retrospectively. I probably never had the idea of making career, becoming a leader when I started off. So much of what I've done may look very determined and career oriented when you look at it retrospectively. But it was more a question of taking the opportunities that came up when they came up. And that's probably the quickest way to, to put it. And that's what I also did when I was uh, offered a professorship in international politics at the uh, that time Cologne Business School, which would probably not be considered to be the typical place for a political scientist. But I was really keen and happy to be able to share my devoted interest for politics with economists, being someone dedicated to international and interdisciplinary research, which I think is a fundamental asset these days, has probably always been, but in the global world, we need it even more. And when I was asked to become a vice president for research there, then after a couple of years, well, I said, are you sure you want a political scientist? And I said, well, yes. So. I did that for about six years and uh, it was a lot of fun. So I'm glad I did it. Sounds like you've been uh, good at uh, grasping the opportunities and saying yes when the opportunity arose. So that's yeah, really think, good. Yes, yeah. I think that's one of the 
you know the things that uh, and you can always leave it afterwards but it's yeah. you know a question of uh th there are just simply some trains that leave they don't come back so. yes and uh, you've been uh, you've been on that train that's really good uh, your your life in real uh, has been very much defined by your passion uh, for the topic uh, of children born at war. Can you share with us how you ended up becoming a world leading expert on this specific field? Sure, uh, I'll be happy to maybe, uh, you know, just to give a very brief uh, summary on what are the children born of war. So uh, the children born of war, the children uh, that are fathered by local mothers and uh, foreign fathers in more usually military setting in another country. Um, and this has changed over the years because the ways wars uh, are carried out has changed too. So it can be anything from being from a different nation state or from another ethnic group or religious group. And um, uh, that being a part of our own family history, I actually never thought it would become also one of the things I would dedicate my life to. So maybe I would need to kind of put that in a bigger setting. Um, I think, well, first of all, uh, there was a, a study going on at my former university. I was in Germany already at that time, uh, which was in the mid late 1990s, carrying out uh, a comparative study amongst the children of uh, German soldiers uh, during World War II that were born to local mothers and German soldiers in World War II in Netherlands, Denmark, and Norway. So I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Uh, it's something new. And um, I, so every time I was back in Bergen, I would read them, the given in, uh, input. So being a comparative political scientist also with a strong emphasis uh, on research methods, I thought, okay, if I would like to just see how this follows up. And after I'd finished my PhD in Germany, which was on a completely different topic, which was development of the German party system after unification, I somehow got into the topic and I was started coding a data from one part of the survey, which is Danish data. When I started this, I got so into this topic. And of course, and at that time, people said, why would you dig in the past? And, you know, when they get older, it's all over. It doesn't matter. But this was at that time in the 1990s, there were already so many different conflicts. You had the Bosnian, you, you heard about the children born in Bosnia by uh, in, in the so-called, well, a, a hard word, but it's called the rape camps, it's what they call where Bosnian women were kept until they were become pregnant uh, by uh, Serb soldiers with the purpose of actually an ethnic cleansing. And so once you start getting involved and you start reading, you realize that this is actually uh, nothing which is just restricted to one time, one country. It's probably been happening during all lifetime of human beings and usually the what women experience in war is considered more or less like uh, collateral damage they're a war booty there's a lot of literature on these aspects and people that are more um, interested or more experts in this field however what I thought was rather disturbing and having all already touched upon children's rights during my, my studies at the University of Bergen, I thought, how can it be that there are specific groups that just aren't heard about, that aren't seen, that whose voices simply don't exist? And, um, and, and that doesn't mean, we call them hidden populations, and that doesn't mean that People may not be aware of them existing. It doesn't mean that they're not visible. It just means that there's they wouldn't necessarily voice themselves. They wouldn't address it. So that's how I found. And, and then the, this just grew. And I reached out to people, networks. I started collecting. I established a network uh, here in Cologne in 2008 and opened up a platform. At that time, without much funding, reached out uh, 
share all information, all knowledge, all networks, just try to, to find a platform where we could somehow get a beginning on understanding um, what is going on, what are the similar and different experiences that children born of war experience throughout various times in conflict. Now, when you do this, you do at the same time, at least that's my view, uh, this is not just something I can just work on from an academic point of view. Once you hear the life stories, you get in the data, you understand what they've experienced. You also, of course, get a commitment of needing to use your knowledge to be able to um, advise or influence important actors at both the national and international agenda. So the research actually has become pretty practical orientated towards addressing the importance of the children born of war to national and international courts, to national and international governments, to the United Nations, to everybody. And those who are into the topic will see it. I mean, it's been work now that I've been working on for more than 20 years. And in the beginning, nobody wanted to talk about the children born of war. And in the meantime, I'm happy to say that we're increasingly invited to a lot of important meetings and settings uh, by governments, being it in, in the United Nations or the Human Rights Council to advise on how to, you know, what to do which is difficult because of course, each situation is different. Unfortunately, with the conflicts coming up, what's going on uh, these days, uh, it doesn't seem to become less. So we're really urging uh, the international community um, to, to find steps and define ways in which the children do not again become um, those the, uh, double victims in, in these cases. And that's, uh, it's an ongoing work. So that's, yes. It will probably yeah. stay my dedication for, yes. for the rest of my life too. Yes. Yeah. And your dedication has been so inspirational. I mean, it's, it's uh, so impressive to have followed you all through these years and we have even managed to do lots of interesting things on uh, this topic um at the various uh norwegian institutions uh where i have been affiliated uh and um really really impressed by everything yes and now you are uh even uh through a, a big grant uh, you got an erc grant uh, and uh, a part-time position at the university of oslo which i'm truly delighted by that we're now our colleagues there as well so, um, Ingvil, uh, is there any defining moment in your life that shaped you as, as a leader that you would like to share with the, with the group here? Um, it's, well, again, I think the retrospectively, uh, I think one of the things that really, maybe not the one defining, but the a very important defining is that I must say that I've been brought up in a family where there was never a doubt when we were one boy, a brother is older than me and three girls, that there, there was never a doubt that we as women or girls, you know, would be able to do exactly the same thing or uh, and so on. So I, I never actually thought about gender issues or inequalities. And then, of course, when you travel between countries, and even in my studies also in Bergen, I say I've been, I, I, at least I have not never experienced that there were any kinds of differences. And I mean, this was in the late 80s, early 90s. Coming to Germany, starting in German working life, I don't think, and that's, maybe I was naive uh, and things kind of were different, but there was one point where I was sitting at a working meeting again in my institute and you know you look around and they're all very good 
colleagues, friends, you work with them greatly, all ages. And at one point I was just like, gosh, they're all men. So I was not only amongst the youngest, I was also the, the only woman and particularly with the academic. That has changed a lot, I must say, also in my institute. But at that time, that really was uh, a defining moment. And then I think afterwards, I, I have a different steps, you know, wondered about how come, you know, he's asked to take up a PhD grant or being that in Germany, you still have this very much the system that it's a professor that asks you to, you know, do this and that. Do you want to be my PhD? Do you want to, you know, habilitate, which is important for an academic career. And that's, and that's where afterwards I think that I probably, you know, that thought exactly the things that you can read in thousands of books about women, that they think that if they're good enough, they're going to be asked. So we don't ask because we think that if you're not addressed specifically, you're just not good enough. <laughs> so, so this is maybe one of the things I've taken up also for my future myself being a leader, you know, that there are just simply also gender differences. In, in this kind. So maybe not just one defining moment, but several defining moments. Although I must say that I have experienced uh, a lot of support by both men and women, junior and senior, also over this. So it's not like, you know, it's, it's typical stereotyping. It's just that when you ask about defining moments, I guess that at least when it became aware to me that there's something going on there that I hadn't thought about before. And that brings me actually into the next part of the question, which is basically what advice would you give young Ingvild going back to entering your professional life that you could share with the people and women watching this little conversation today? Um, it, it's um, an, an interesting question. I mean, it always you know, you always get these um, networks and, you know, these things that you do. And I think that, as I told you in the beginning, that I probably never was this targeted and goal oriented, but I think, and I still think and believe that the really important thing is that you are interested in what you're doing. You think there's a value in what you're doing. You're dedicated to what you're doing because then you're usually also very good at what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is that you, there may be loops in life that may not seem to fit into um, the career pattern, going linear, straightforward. But if you have a stomach feeling that it's still the good thing to do, do it. It's how I combine my passion for the research with uh, the uh, work that I consider highly important, uh, which is what I do in the research data alliance, working towards open sharing, where I just come from a, a big uh, virtual plenary we had this week. So not being afraid of also following these things, because I have made the experience that these are also areas where opportunities have arisen, because you simply then also happen to be at a time in a place where maybe you have combinations that others haven't because they have been too kind of goal oriented towards getting into a specific position. So keep grasping these opportunities and chances with the missed opportunities and, and, uh, and that uh, because they don't come back simply. And then you can always, if it turns out to be a dead end, you could always leave it, but it's much harder uh, to then say, oh, I'm sorry, I should have. And then because then, as I said, the train's gone. The other thing is also in the individual dimension. I mean, it is so important that you find that you have a partner. I see this as, uh, you know, having a, a, a developing a career towards a leadership has to be a really equal partnership. And that goes with also beyond the time when you have family. So, I th and that goes both ways, by the way. I think that's not only, I think we see more and more the dual career couples share, there's no use in having competition. You need real partnerships. And then 
Um, I would say that um, see, don't be afraid to ask. People who can always say no, uh, you know, to not join, let them join your network or not mentor you uh, or so. But the probably one of the biggest mistakes that typically we women do is that we just don't reach out maybe enough um, to to get the network and the mentors and the contact partners that would help us to get ahead and and also communicate that we would be interested in having power power sounds has a kind of a mixed taste for many but i would say and that's probably one of the things i would really uh, give as an advice i don't think it is a bad thing to have power because it gives you a great opportunity to do and put the agenda and set the agenda to what is important and being in the power to do that is fundamental and it's much easier than not being in power and then trying to make influence from below having said that Power is always risky, so we have to learn not to be too emotional when things go wrong or we are being criticized. Um, so it's a question of no, just doing it and then taking what comes with it. Good advice, good advice. Uh, and then uh, lastly, but not uh, least, why do you think there's a need for a network like uh, Women in Global Health in a society that regards itself as having full equality like Norway and and also living in Germany and also being a member of Women in Global Health Germany, how, how would you compare the two? <laughs> yeah, interesting question. Um, I, yes, Norway is great in terms of equality. I still think that there is, uh, you know, it depends a little bit on where you see in the sectors. And I think also in Norway, you have a lot of this positions that men are still in a lot of powerful position and women do the work at different levels. So, uh, and I think that also Norway is still characterized. And I think that goes all over Norway and Germany is that we have to think about what are the characteristics that defines a leader in the 21st century. And we always hear women are so great leaders because they are so empathetic, they are, can uh, have a lot of things at the same on the agenda at the same time, they're good communicators, but the leadership role are still defined by very masculine characteristics. And that's not just in Germany, it's still in Norway. So if you look at who even we women may perceive as good leaders is the risk taking, um, powerful um, um, very often white middle-aged men and this is something i guess we just need to be much more aware of which kinds of mechanisms in our culture defines how we how we see and define the leadership role and i think that also when you look at the statistics on the distribution of leadership roles in, for example, health in the health system or in the global health system, we still see that there's a huge difference between the levels in the hierarchy, in the positions when it comes to the distribution of gender. And that is so important, just to give that very final point, because that's really important to me. If we don't have not just the gender, aspect or diversity, but also diversity in general in areas such as global health too. Um, there are a lot of issues that are not raised. There are topics that are not addressed. There are data that are not collected because you need to see a problem. You need to know about it. You need to be aware about it in order to put it on the table and start looking into it. So I think that this is one of also of the fundamental reasons why we need to make sure that we do have proper gender representation uh, on all areas in global health, uh, also in our countries, because we still have 
Well, as they say in German, Luft nach oben, air. Um, <laughs> so still things that we can do there. Thank you, Ingvild, and uh, you are such a great asset to our advisory board. We're really happy to have you uh, in our network and uh, in our movement. You're a true inspiration and uh, um, looking forward to working more with you in the months to come ahead. So thank you for today. Thank you. Thank you, Ingeborg. It's great to work with you and I'm really honored to be able to be a part of this uh, great network that you have established. Thank you. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in and we look forward to welcoming you back for a next afternoon tea conversation coming to your inbox very soon. Goodbye.